sponsored by the James Madison Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. Hello, and welcome to the 2021 National Book Festival. I'm Maureen Corrigan. I'm the book critic for NPR's Fresh Air. I'm also a regular contributor to the Washington Post book world. I am here with the superb suspense writer, Tana French. Tana French has written eight suspense novels. Uh, six of them are the Dublin Murder Squad books, and two are standalones. Her latest is called The Searcher, and that's the book that I'd like to focus on today, but I hope we get to talk about everything. Tana French, um, I'm, I'm a big fan, as, as are so many people I know, and they're so envious that I'm getting to, to talk with you today. Welcome to this virtual book festival. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maureen. I'm delighted to be here. And thank you so much for doing this, because not to be too mutual admiration, but I've been a fan of your writing for a long time. So this is great. I appreciate that very much. Um, the theme of this book festival this year, not surprisingly, is open a book, open the world. And of course, so many of us have reached for books to, to open a world during this pandemic. So I, I, I just wonder, what have books meant to you in throughout your life? And then more specifically, what have books meant to you during this particular peculiar frightening <laughs> period that we're living through, still living yeah. through? Well, I was always, I was one of those total immersion readers when I was a kid. I was, you know, if you gave me a new book, basically I was gone. I didn't exist until I'd finished the last page. I, I always loved reading. I kind of miss that now because, you know, when adulthood and kids kick in, you don't get the chance to do that, to just vanish into a book for hours <laughs> on end. I think um, during the pandemic mainly, it's been really interesting to watch what we prioritize and to discuss with friends who's reading what and what it is we're looking for during this time. I know, I, I've known a lot of people who are, who are looking for escape, who are reading books about really far away times or reading science fiction that would take them completely out of any of this. And other people were looking for a sort of resonance, were reading books about plagues or natural disasters. They really wanted something that they felt connected to this time. And I didn't go there at all. I, I went, <laughs> a lot yeah. of mine, I, I reread all the Agatha Christie, right? All the Agatha Christie, because I figured out halfway through, I was looking for something with an ending, with a solution, with all the ends neatly tied up and the crisis is contained, it's completed, it's finished and we're done with it. And usually in Christie, you know, nobody is, is too deeply traumatized right. by anything that happened. Everybody can move on. There are exceptions obviously, but overall. So there was a lot, I felt like I was looking for something that would resolve everything and let everyone move on. But my big pandemic book, the one that that I'm just recommending to everyone during this, is Amor Tolz's A Gentleman in Moscow. Oh, okay. Well, he's in lockdown, basically. He's in a decades long lockdown yeah. Yeah. in a hotel. The yeah. the his his main character is a, a count, white Russian, who's been put in house arrest in a Moscow hotel for the rest of his life, basically. And it's such a lovely book because it's all about how even in the, the saddest, the most restrictive, the most dislocating times, we find ways to make connections and we find ways to find happiness and to make little differences in people's lives. And I really liked that. Like I'd read it before lockdown <laughs> initially, but rereading it during lockdown was a whole different experience. And I, I'm really glad I had that book there. It's a terrific recommendation. You have family history connected to Russia, don't you? One, one of your grandparents? Yeah. My grandmother was Russian and was from very much that background. Yeah, yeah. She was born uh, a countess and born early because of, of fighting on the streets of Moscow. So this is kind of the world that one side of my family comes from. My mother actually gave me the book going, if you want to understand my side of the family, read this. Yes, yeah, yeah. it's so interesting. Well, let's talk about you and let's, let's talk about <laughs> you, The Searcher, your latest novel, which is a standalone. Um, I was blown away by it. I think every, it has everything. It has the plot. It has this brooding atmosphere. Um, 
it has an amazing situation that I don't think you've used before unless my mind is blanking. You have an American who's your main character and, and you're, you've set it in rural Ireland. Your novels are usually set in the city or in the suburbs. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's been a novel that has been set out in the remote countryside, which seems a little malevolent. It's always watchful. <laughs> but yeah. I'm sure listeners would much rather have you give a little thumbnail kind of introduction to the premise of this novel, the main character, and why he's out there in, in rural Ireland. Well, he's a, a middle-aged American guy who has just retired from the Chicago police force after 25 years there, when he's basically lost all his faith in the job and mm. he's just had a tough divorce and he is kind of having a moral crisis. And he reckons that by getting away from all the places where he was a police officer, where, the, where he was a husband, where he was a father, all the things that he feels he's somehow made a mess of, morally speaking. Yeah. Maybe if he gets somewhere that will be simpler, he'll be able to find his sense of right and wrong again. And he reckons that a little Irish rural village miles from anywhere is going to be a good place to see this. <laughs> Only it kind of doesn't work out that way because a neighbor kid whose uh, teenage brother has disappeared demands that Cal, the protagonist, investigate. Yeah. And of course, he gets drawn in for one more investigation. <laughs> one of my favorite parts of your setup is that Cal buys the cottage in Ireland over the internet, right? He never, yeah. he, it's just, you know, based on those, those photographs. And of course, when he arrives, there's a lot of work to be done, which he kind of knows, but I guess he doesn't really know the, the depth of the work to be done. Um, I think you do a wonderful job of giving us this character who has some sense of how his life has, has fallen apart a bit, but he's not sitting around at night doing deep analysis because oh, yeah. he's not that kind of a man. So, uh, you know, it, there's, a, there's a section of the novel where he's thinking back to a, a, a conversation with his wife that seemed to be a turning point and eventually led to their divorce, but he can't figure out why it was a turning point, you know? <laughs> and he, he seems very, um, so genuine to me in that, that he could probably, he can read a crime scene, he, he can read other people, but about his own life, he's a little, um, he's still a little bit in the dark. Um, so, yeah, he's not introspective. And no. that, was, that was deliberate. I really didn't want to write an introspective character because right. I just finished writing The Witch Home yes. where the main site of all the action is yes. inside the main character's head. Yes. And I did not want to write anyone introspective. I was very done with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wanted to write somebody who was all about action, for whom the defining elements of anyone, including himself, weren't what does this person think? What does this person feel? What does this person say? It was all about, no, 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 you're defined by what you do. What does yeah. this person do? Yeah. And it's yeah. probably why the book's in the third person, because if you're first person, then it's an implica the implication there is that what's inside the main character's head is important. And to mm -hmm. Cal, that wouldn't be important at all. It doesn't matter. You can think all the right things, but if you're not doing the right things, it doesn't count. Mm. So that's why third person, where what you focus on is what he does, which is what matters to him. Mm. I, I, I think that this is a novel that if you're at all agoraphobic, you might want to think <laughs> twice about reading it. <laughs> because, and I'm, I, I was born in New York City. I live in Washington. I lived in Philadelphia. I'm, I'm used to cities. And I'm used to those landscapes that are mapped out in streets. And this novel has so many moments where Hal is sitting outside at night and he feels eyes watching him and he doesn't, it's almost like the landscape is, is always watching him. Um, and I, I, I find that more terrifying than say walking down a, a dark alley, but uh, in a, in any city. But I wondered about Cal, if, um, if there was something of you in him in the sense that you were born in Vermont, as anyone who's looked at your biography knows, you, you've lived various places all over the world. You came to Ireland for college and there must have been a time when you were still trying to figure out the, co the nuanced codes of behavior and, and what people really meant. 
there's an amazing chapter here, chapter 11, where I don't think I breathed once when, uh, when I was reading it, where Cal is in the local pub, which is basically a cottage in the middle of a field. And all of the men around him are sort of making jokes. And he can't quite tell sometimes how hostile they're being yeah. or whether they're really jokes. You know, he's the outsider. And I wondered if, um, A, if you felt any of that when you first made that move to Ireland. And if, if I don't know, if any of that shows up in Cal, maybe it doesn't. No, I think definitely that was kind of a normal feature of my life up until yeah. I moved here because we moved around a lot. And when you're an international brat or I think third culture kid is the term <laughs> they use most often, yeah. <laughs> international brat. Yeah. You're, you get very used to that. You get very used to, you move a new place, you have to be completely on the alert to figure out what the codes are, what the language is that you don't speak. I, you know, I'm not talking, you know, moving to Italy, you need to speak Italian. Yeah. What's the, the, the physical, the subtext language, all of these little codes that you need to learn. So that was very much a feature of yeah. our lives when I was moving around as a kid. And Definitely when I moved to Ireland, it's the same thing because the Irish sense of humor, it's quite oblique, it's quite dry, you have to get used to it. And you know, I'd been coming here for summer, so I had an advantage, mm. I had friends already. But of course it takes getting used to. And I thought that for Cal in particular, because it's just him surrounded by people who have known each other for, not just for their whole lives, but for generations, basically. Yeah. He's coming into a world where everyone speaks a language he doesn't and where they're using that against him. Yeah. They're not just yeah. it's not just that he has to get used to it the way I did because you know you're new in town. It was that he has to get used to something that they're very deliberately using to keep him in a position where he understands just as much <laughs> as they want him to. Yeah. So he's he's being kept on the back foot. He's being kept unbalanced by this being the new guy in town. Yeah. With great deliberation by the people who live there. Yeah, and, and as in so many of your novels, um, the situation darkens. Where I almost felt like if he doesn't crack the code more deftly, his life is, is in peril. Like there, there, there's a cost to not, to not really understanding what you're hearing and how people are behaving and exactly how threatening it might be. Um, I, 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 I characterized the novel when I did a review of it for the Post as, as a slow burn because you just keep yeah. turning up <laughs> the heat. <laughs> and um, it's spectacular. I, I, would, I won't even ask you to read from it because you need to read a lot and we're on, you know, we're online. It doesn't yeah. work, um, but it, it's, it's really spectacular. I would love to hear you read that chapter one day. <laughs> <laughs> that one was fun to write. I'd oh, say I can thing, imagine. Oh. The whole thing was fun to write. Not every book is, but Cal was nice to spend yeah. time. With. Yeah. He comes to this town. Yes. Uh, an adolescent shows up at his door and eventually this young person draws Cal in and says, I want you to look for my brother. My brother is older brother. My older brother has disappeared and the police aren't doing en enough or anything. And of course, like many a, <laughs> a detective hero before him, uh, these guys always get involved. You know, they, they always go on that quest and they, they answer that summons. You called the novel, The Searcher and as everyone has pointed out, in, there's there's a tip of the hat uh, to the John Ford classic mm -hmm. Western, The Searchers. And I, I love that. I, mean, I even wondered if there was a wink that it was set in the west of Ireland. I don't know, you know, yeah. overthink that. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah, that was <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 But, yeah. But I, I was a little surprised, and I wondered if you were, at some of the um, kind of the blowback that you had patterned this kind of homage to the Western after The Searchers, which is such a controversial classic these days because of the racism, because of the depiction of, of Native Americans, because of the violent um, you know, hatred uh, that the, especially the John Wayne character directs to the Native Americans who've stolen his niece. You know, it's a very violent film. And that's 
that's a, I think there was there was especially one uh, review in Slate where um, you know it was almost like you shouldn't have done this. You shouldn't have chosen that particular film to nod to. You know that's over. Um, were you surprised? And how do you answer criticism like that? I'll be honest. I very seldom read reviews because. Yeah. What happens then is I start thinking about the previous book, which is finished. Yeah. I start going, oh my God, maybe they've got a point. Maybe I should have yeah. done this differently. And then I'm not writing whatever yeah. I'm supposed to be writing. So yeah. it, it's a distraction. I don't think it's true that it was patterned after The Searcher, which I'll be honest, I have only read part of mm -hmm. the, the Searchers. I've only the read searcher. part of It's definitely got serious Western influences. But that wasn't one of the Westerns that I was reading or nodding to in particular. I mean, yeah. I was reading more Lonesome Dove and True mm. Grit and mm. The Sisters Brothers for a modern one. Oh, I haven't the read Searchers, that. No, The Searchers, I mean, the title has, you know, yeah. there's a definite reference there. But it was more that it felt like a good title that would fit both of the main yeah. characters yeah. while also having that Western influence. But I don't think it's got, from what I read of the book, the searchers. Mm -hmm. I don't think it has anything particularly in common with that, except some of the Western, the great Western themes, like mm -hmm. the quest, the mm -hmm. journey to find someone. Yeah. But that's through so many of the Westerns. There isn't a specific yeah. reference to the searchers I wouldn't have thought okay. yeah, anywhere I, in the book. I think it was um, the general situation of looking for a young person who's disappeared. Um, moving into territory that's not your own somehow and having to navigate it, it you know. That, well, that's I, all Westerns so though. Yeah, that's, of course, that's yeah, the core of, of most Westerns. Yeah, I of course. I mean, again, you know, you get that in Lonesome Dove, for example, yeah. when um, Gus goes looking for Lorena, yeah. who's been abducted. And, and it's very clear in Lonesome Dove that they're aware that, or Gus at least is aware, that he's in territory that isn't really his and that he's doing something that isn't what he thought he'd be doing here yeah. and that he's destroying things. Yeah. So I think there is, that's a main theme and all Westerns have moving into territory that's not your own. But what I liked about Lonesome Dove in particular is that it has an awareness that by moving into territory that's not your own, you can have an impact that is not what you planned, mm -hmm. that is not what you foresaw. And you can be much more destructive than you ever than ever occurred to you, that you can just great bounce point. in all oblivious, thinking yeah. that, you know, yay, I'm just living my life and bouncing yeah. in here. And you can end up doing a huge amount of damage that you never planned on doing. And that was one of the things from Lonesome Dove that I really liked and yeah. that I hoped would seep through in this book, his, his growing awareness that you have an impact you didn't plan on when yeah. you go into territory that's not yours. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's such a wonderful point. Um, the detective novel, has often, and the mystery novel, American mystery, has has also, you know, been credited as having roots in the cowboy story. I mean, usually you've got the huh. lone, the lone detective, yeah. right? You, you know, I'm thinking of the, especially hard-boiled American detective fiction, kind of the almost like the frontier of the city, the wildness of the city in in uh, Maltese Falcon, and um, you know, all of Raymond Chandler, that that kind of thing. Um, and also that kind of tough guy character who's very interior. Um, I'm trying to get at a question about genre because I, I know mm. that you've 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 kind of talked about genre and said, well, genre is breaking down. And I think a lot of writers feel feel that these days that you know writers like yourself, you're exploring different ways to almost link genres or break down the barriers. And yet I'm wondering if, if there's a if there's an advantage besides marketing to to having your novels be labeled suspense novels or even police procedurals. Like if there's an enjoyment that someone like myself gets from seeing a writer like you ring changes on a familiar formula and that's part of the pleasure. Like I felt that here. Like oh isn't that clever what she's doing? by almost marrying these two genres, the Western and, and the detective novel and setting it in a different place that way. Um, I'm not even quite sure what my question is, but, I, 
<laughs> but I, you're obviously you're doing something in your work as you, you you're starting you're working with these standalones. Um, I I hope you're going back to the Dublin Murder Squad at some point. I don't know if you are, but you're 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 challenging yourself. And does does genre feel restrictive? Is that part of the reason to you know keep pushing the bounds? Well, I'll be honest, when I started in the woods, I didn't think I was writing detective fiction. I yeah. thought I was just writing a book that mm -hmm. had a detective framework because otherwise, I mean, I write long anyway. If I don't have that framework, yeah. I'm just going to keep writing. It'll be 10 million <laughs> words long and I'll never finish. Yeah. So I thought I was writing a book, just a book book that had that framework to keep it in place. Yeah. But then my publishers explained that it's a good thing to put it somewhere mm. that makes sense so where readers yeah. know to look. Um, I think... I came along at a lucky point in terms of genre because the boundaries were starting to be seen not as endpoints, but as fun things to play with. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at Dennis Lehan mm -hmm. with Mystic River, yeah. now that is a great <laughs> mystery novel, but it's also a great social history novel and yeah. a coming of age novel and a, a family saga and just a great book with great yeah. thematic depth and great characterization. People were starting to go, okay, here are the conventions of the mystery genre. How can I play with them? How can I use them as a starting point rather than a finishing point? And yeah. so I stepped into a space where that was very much a possibility, where you can go, mm -hmm. okay, I'll, I think I'll yeah. have a spin on noir this time, or, oh, what if I want to borrow a bit of Gothic here? Or, okay, yeah. Westerns. I like the idea of sticking some Western conventions in the West of Ireland for a change. Mm -hmm. Let's try that. It, it was very, not unbounded, but the boundaries had become something interesting. Yes. by the time I came along. So I got lucky, yes. I think, because I like that. I don't I don't like being in my comfort zone as a writer. Yeah. I find yeah. it very unsettling, and I don't want to fall into the temptation, which I think is quite easy in, in genre where you have this one matrix to work with, the temptation of writing the same book over and over, finding yes. something that works for me and going, yeah. well, I'll basically do this again and again. Yes. And I think the mystery genre at this point is so open that it's easy to find a new tangent every time to play with it's it's very accepted i think especially in the us where you guys are really really good at creating and accepting new subgenres and sub subgenres and it's just it's really fertile ground it i is. think audiences like that it so is. yeah i came along at a good time yeah um i i think we are in something of a second renaissance and i think that for a while just my take on it, the excitement um, of the 80s and 90s where there were all different kinds of detectives and they weren't just the straight white men, you know, people of color, gay, lesbian characters coming in and, and they were the center of the story investigating what's wrong with America. There was a lot of energy and, and then it seemed to drain away, I think, because those independent mystery bookshops started closing. Um, you know, something happened there. And now it seems like there's, um, you know, I think about Emily St. John Mandel and the kind of books she's writing, which are partly suspense stories, married to dystopian fiction. You know, it, 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 it does seem like maybe the energy is um, also with the admixture of genres that you're talking about. I love the way in the Dublin Murder Squad novels, you do something so wonderful. And, and everyone who's read them knows this already, but you keep passing the baton. So yeah. the spotlight shifts, you know, you've got, um, one character in the center, and then in the next novel, the, the partner of that character will be in the center, and we go on and on from there. And what that also does um, is, is sh of course, shift our understanding of those characters. Do we see them from the inside versus the outside? Um, if we see them in a different context, does our reading of them change? I I love to think about the larger mysteries that novelists are investigating and, you know, tell me if I'm wrong or not even near the mark. But I, I also think of you as, as, as a writer, a serious writer who likes to investigate that question of how can we ever know? How can we ever know anyone? How, yeah. how do we know ourselves? How do we know anyone else? You know, it, it, it's, it seems like so much is dependent on the context and the relationships at that time. And those Dublin Murder Squad mysteries, um, I think they would be a wonderful uh, 
group of novels to teach in a psychology course, you know, for that reason. Um, that had to be in your mind as, as, as you were writing them, as you were structuring the arc of them that way. I, well, I didn't think. do it on purpose because I don't okay. write my head very well. <laughs> but as I, no, as I got into it, as I realized that I wanted to do the kind of chain link thing, that was definitely one of the things that, that drew me to it. Because to me, this is probably the core point of the arts, of any art, is that it gives you this chance to see the world, even for a brief glimpse, through someone else's eyes and to realize that this other person's reality is as vivid and as present and as real as your own and that they're experiencing this world entirely differently and they're seeing you entirely differently from how you see yourself and every every part of their existence is shaped by factors and seen through a lens that is not yours mm. and that's at the heart of every book is it's this glimpse into somebody else's world and I really like the idea that by shifting from character to character, and also by having unreliable narrators, which I do yeah. a lot, yeah. you suddenly realize that that we're all seeing things through our own lens all the time and that the lens shifts, the lens changes. You know, the most obvious example is there's a character called Scorcher Kennedy who is in, in Faithful Place. He's a supporting character and he is this pompous, rule-bound, up himself, Get yeah. because that's what the narrator needs to see him as at that moment, and then he's the narrator of the next book, and he's not like that. He has his reasons for sticking to the rules; they matter to him. He's damaged, he's in pain, and he needs those rules to hold himself together because he doesn't trust his own mind. Yeah. Yeah. And I liked doing that and going. The person who you think you see has reasons that you will never know for being. Yeah who he or she is, has layers underneath that we may never understand. And, you know, you're writing mysteries and the most fascinating and beautiful, painful, all of those things, mystery of all, is the human mind, is other people. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a mystery is a really good genre to let you into trying to touch on that mystery. Yes, yeah. Um... When I think of Scorcher, I think of Broken Harbor and really? how how uh, that amazing um, setting of a, a, a housing estate that's gone bust um, is such a wonderful, you know, objective correlative to the way he is. He's broken too. That 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 amazing landscape. Um, you just you keep coming up with or finding these settings in your novels that are so vivid and um, they're just, you know, it's a cliche, but they are they are such a, a present character in the novel. I, do you start with the settings? I mean, do you have to have the setting in your head first before you can go, yeah. yeah. Yes, actually, yeah. <laughs> that is one of the few things I do have. I have like a clear sense of the main character. I have a really basic premise and I have a core setting mm. because you're right, I love places and they feel very, highly charged to me. And I put this down to the fact that we moved around so much when I was a kid. Oh, so every yeah. place is sort of associated with a phase of my life very strongly. It's not that I've lived in the one place and it's got all the different phases of my life. I kind of associate different phases of my life with these different places. So they seem, they feel in memory, very charged up with all those experiences. And I think yeah. that kind of led me to see places that way, very deeply charged with the experiences of people who have lived with them and having a presence, a, a force almost of their own. And I think that kind of seeps out oh, in my books. It does, it absolutely does. Um, Tana, you just spoke very powerfully to really what, what, a, what a writer can do, which is to bring to life someone who is not them um, and to, to step very into that character's mind and history and make them available to us, the readers. I'm just coming off of an academic year where it seems like every class I taught, 85% of our conversations were about identity, understandably, mm -hmm. given the year that we've had um, in this country, with Black Lives Matter, the Trump presidency, all of that. And, and so I'm selfishly asking you a question that I've wondered about with a lot of writers, are there any characters who you feel as, as a, a writer, you don't have the right to inhabit? Ah, interesting yeah. one. Yeah. Okay, I'm 
a big believer in the idea that we shouldn't stick to ourselves. Mm -hmm. This goes against the whole idea of, again, what the arts are about to me, the idea that I can only write about a 40-something third culture kid who's yeah. wound up in Ireland is right. That, that's absolutely anathema to everything I believe about the arts. But if that said, if you're going to write somebody who's not you, you better make sure that you have some kind of in-depth understanding of what it is like to be that person and that you have spent an awful lot of time listening to people who have that experience. So I think there are a lot of experiences that I couldn't write, definitely not as, as you know, from, from within, mm -hmm. from first person or as a protagonist, because there are not enough years in my life for me to spend enough time listening that mm -hmm. I would understand that experience well enough to do it justice. Mm -hmm. I think the, the biggest one for me has been writing um, Toby, the narrator in The Witch Hunt, yeah. who's suffering from a brain injury yeah. and who has been broken pretty much physically and mentally yeah. by this brain injury. And I went, mm -hmm. if I'm going to write this, I had better spend a lot of time listening to people who have gone through this because I'm writing about something real mm -hmm. that has had a huge impact on many people's lives and I would want to get that right. So yeah. I spent a lot of time reading everything mm -hmm. on forums for people who were going through traumatic brain injury, acquired brain injury, trying to understand. <sighs> it wasn't just that I wanted to ask people questions, because if you ask questions of people, you're only asking what you want to hear, whereas you need to be hearing yes, what it right. is that they want to say. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time just reading, just reading people's experiences and what's was unexpected to them and what was important to them mm -hmm. and hoping that I would bloody do this justice mm -hmm. because if you're going to take on something like that you would want to do it right and I have had a couple of people who either they or family members have acquired brain injuries say yes that is true to what it's felt like and that was a huge relief yes because yeah if you're going to take on something that isn't your experience that isn't your identity you better be ready to do enough listening to do it justice and there will be places where you can never there, yeah. there's not enough time in your life to yeah. do enough listening yeah. to do it justice yeah that's that's uh that's a that's that's a wonderful answer it's an answer i'm going to mull over you know <laughs> given <laughs> given all of the debate this year in, in classes um but i i i as as a reader my greatest pleasure is stepping into the shoes of people who are not me i mean it's, sometimes i like to see familiar places and emotions in what I read. But I also like to go outside of myself, which I guess brings us back to the beginning of our conversation where we're talking about pandemic literature and how you get outside of yourself through, through reading. I want to ask you one more question because your many, many fans will be angry if I don't ask what's next. <laughs> what, what can we expect from you next? I am a little kind of wary about even saying this because I was so I was so thrown like everybody else by the pandemic. Yeah. I I hadn't realized really quite how much of writing is your subconscious working away and doing the job for you. And like everybody else, for much of this year, like I haven't had a subconscious. It's just yeah. been a smoking <laughs> waste. <laughs> so I felt like a yeah. wimp. Everybody else is out there doing their job, and I'm going, eh, no, can't write, got no brain. <laughs> Oh, come on, pull it together. Stop being such a precious little fragile flower. Yeah. But no, I didn't get an awful lot of writing done this year, but yeah. I have got stuck back into it the last while. And I seem to be, although I'm still a bit dodgy about even saying it, unexpectedly writing a sequel to The Searcher, which oh, was well, oh, not oh, interesting. the plan, That's not particularly the plan. Right? But I realized for one thing that I had really enjoyed spending time with these people in, the, yeah. in this world. And for another thing, um, there were more sweets in the piñata, basically. I felt <laughs> like there was more story. There was yeah. more story there. Yeah, like, wonderful. I, wanted, I wanted to know what would happen next. I felt like those characters might have a bit more story. That's so terrific. I am starting on that. And oh, hopefully terrific. Getting that's, somewhere that's, that's terrific. Good, good. Well, that's a teaser for everyone. As, as <laughs> It's early days. <laughs> Thank you so much for this conversation, Tana. It's It's been such a treat to talk with you. And thank you for all the books all these years. Long may they continue. Uh, thank you. I will keep writing as long as you guys will keep reading. <laughs> and thank you so much for doing this. It has been absolutely lovely, and I so appreciate it. 
We hope you've enjoyed this conversation, and now we'd like you to hear more from the library's own experts on this topic. Welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm joining you today from the Thomas Jefferson Building. I am Barbara Baer, and I am a historian in the Manuscript Division. The Manuscript Division is one of several special collections divisions in the Library of Congress. I oversee manuscript materials in the areas of literature, culture, and the arts. The Manuscript Division is home to the papers of many writers, including poets, novelists, philosophers, and theorists. We have popular culture writers, too, including materials about the thrillers of Daphne du Maurier, author of Rebecca, My Cousin Rachel, Don't Look Now, and The Birds, in the Ken McCormick papers, and writers of Westerns like Owen Wister and Dee Brown. In the hard-boiled fiction genre, a standout collection is the papers of James M. Cain. Cain and his friend Raymond Chandler, author of The Big Sleep featuring Private Eye Philip Marlowe, both straddled the worlds of fiction writing and Hollywood screenwriting. Several Cain novels were made into films, including Double Indemnity, for which Chandler wrote the screenplay with Billy Wilder. The Postman Always Rings Twice, and Mildred Pierce, featuring a standout performance by Joan Crawford. Raymond Chandler wrote to James M. Kane on Paramount Pictures' letterhead in 1944 to say he was so worn out by working on screenplays he was taking a break in the desert. He congratulates Kane that Warner Brothers has picked up Mildred Pierce, praises the positive response to Double Indemnity, and talks about the difference between writing dialogue for a novel versus a film. In the record copy of his response, Kane writes back to say he agrees about the challenges in redoing dialogue, and he praises Chandler's work in the adapted screenplay. In 1946, Kane writes to Joan Crawford at Grauman's Chinese Theater to wish her good luck at that evening's Academy Awards in which she won the Best Actress Award for Mildred Pierce. She wrote a week later to thank him for his impact on her life. Kane's editor, Alfred A. Knopf, meanwhile had written to Kane in 1934 to warn him that after the success of Postman, the tough or hard-boiled label critics had applied to him as a writer of psychological crime novels set in urban landscapes might stick, and he was right, it did. The papers also include galley proofs for The Postman Always Rings Twice, with its opening account of a drifter soon to encounter ill fate. Come enjoy more in the James M. Kane papers for yourself, or visit the library's Motion Pictures Division for more examples of crime fiction, thrillers, and Western novels adapted to film, many of them on the National Film Registry.